It is the year of our Lord, 1911. Qing China has fallen. It's over. Over 2,000 years, emperors and their dynasties have ruled over China, rising and falling in a cycle of transference of the mandate of heaven. But now that cycle had been broken. Broken in the 1911 revolution. I saw the Qing dynasty put down for good after years of strife, subjugation, and endless rebellion. However, China was still deep in the woods. Despite a president being sworn in and a central government established, the fall of the Qing simply created a power vacuum that was too strong. Regional army generals broke away from the central government's weak control and rose up to control regions as warlords, fighting for any land, power, and wealth they could grab. It's here that the stage is set for a local bandit and well-endowed thug named Zhang Zongchang to make his mark on the world. A man who was cruel yet charismatic, greedy yet generous, adored by many and hated by even more. His life is surrounded by half-truths and slander, yet none of it seems too unrealistic for him. He is the most interesting man in China. Zhang was born in 1881 in Yi County, Shandong Province, China. He was born into a poor family of an alcoholic head shaver and musician father and a quote, practicing witch and exorcist mother. She was a 19th century witch talk crystal girl before those were even a thing. Zhang's parents eventually divorced and Zhang moved with his mother to Manchuria when Zhang was a teenager. While growing up in Manchuria, Zhang started working, doing what I would describe as Thieves Guild side quests for a living. He became a petty criminal, pickpocket, bouncer, and even a prospect. Bastard. At some point he even worked in Siberia, picking up the Russian language while there and even serving as an auxiliary for the Russian Imperial Army during the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905. After the war, he returned to China and became a bandit highwayman in the Chinese countryside, even forming and leading his own bandit crew. When the 1911 revolution broke out, Zhang saw an opportunity to make a name for himself. He had already had experience in warfare and combat from serving as an auxiliary in Russia, as well as gaining leadership experience leading his own bandit crew. The end of the Qing dynasty had left China wide open for any general, warlord, or politician to grab as much power and plunder as they could, and Zhang could use this chaos to climb the ladder to power. He was built for this. He was a former soldier and current boss level bandit. He was in the perfect place. He started by offering support to an army regiment in Jiangsu led by a Cheng Dechuan, going on to impress him so much that Zhang was named as his successor, an early showcase of his charisma and uncanny ability to impress on his superiors. Zhang operated as a regiment commander under Lang Yuquin, spending his time fighting local bandits and other bushwhack rabble until 1913, when the Second Revolution broke out over tensions between the increasingly monarchistic Beiyang government, led by General Yuan Shikai, and the nationalist Kuomintang supporters of Sun Yat-sen. Zhang's superior Lang Yuquin sided with the Kuomintang rebels. Bad move. The rebels lost and Lang was killed, with General Feng Guozhang disbanding the unit Zhang commanded, leaving our guy Zhang essentially unemployed. With Zhang's position lost, he needed a way to get back in the game. On May 18, 1916, Chen Kimei, revolutionary leader and mentor to the later founder of modern Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek, was assassinated in Shanghai by Zhang, possibly under the orders of Feng Guozhang. Regardless, by killing Chen, Zhang was able to prove himself as an asset to Feng, and was even elevated to Feng's personal guard when Feng became vice president of the Republic of China. Feng Guozhang passed in 1919, and Zhang continued to operate as a small-time warlord until 1922, when he returned to Manchuria and joined up with the Feng Tian clique. Led by the old marshal and fellow Zhang and fellow former bandit Zhang Zhulin. This isn't like any clique you may have seen in high school. The Feng Tian clique was a large warlord faction based in northeastern China and was very active during the warlord period and had close ties to Japanese interests in Manchuria. Some time passes and it's Zhang Zhulin's birthday! <coughs> All of his generals are in attendance, bringing lavish gifts and hope to gain favor with the old marshal. However, Zhang Zhongchang was nowhere to be found. He flaked on the party. And for his gift, Zhang had sent Zhang two empty coolie baskets as gifts, a coolie being a now offensive term used for low-wage laborers. Baffled by this gift of essentially two empty cardboard boxes, Zhu Lin soon realized the meaning of these gifts. The empty baskets were meant to symbolize Zhongchang's willingness to hold any heavy responsibilities that Zhu Lin may place on him. Impressed by such thoughtfulness and clever usage of metaphor, Zhu Lin rewarded Zhang Chang with a command position in the Feng Tian army. However, Zhang Chang still refused to meet with Zhu Lin in person until Zhu Lin could prove himself in battle, only meeting with Zhu Lin when Zhang saw him emerge victorious in a battle. A bold strategy to call your own boss and supreme commander pussy, but Zhang had a riz about him that let him get away with it. Zhang was able to gain much success fighting for the clique through some pretty unorthodox methods for the time. He was an expert at using armored trains in warfare, manning the trains with veteran Tsarist Russian refugees who had fled Russia during the 1917 revolution, known as White Russians. He was able to recruit them due to his knowledge of the Russian language and connections he made when working and serving in Siberia. 
He had also organized them into specialized units to man the trains, which they used to great effect. Sometimes even having them dress in Tsarist regalia. Maybe he just wanted to make them feel less homesick. And he even had a unit of Cossack bodyguards that he would travel with. He was also one of the first Chinese generals to incorporate women into his military units, complete with an entire unit of white Russian women who acted as nurses and field medics, who spread their knowledge to their Chinese counterparts to great efficiency. The usage of women as effective medics helped to greatly improve the morale of Zhang's armies, along with keeping his soldiers alive longer. 1924 rolls around, and the Fengtian clique get into a second war with the rival Zhili clique, a more liberally minded clique with ties to American and Anglo interests over a spat to decide who gets administrative control over the city of Shanghai. And after losing to the Jili first time around in the first Jili Fengtian War, the Fengtians were fiending for some vengeance, having been preparing for a war with the Jili since at least 1923. During this war, Zhang was putting in some serious work for the Fengtians, capturing Lenkaogon Pass from the Jili after one of their generals, Feng Yuzhan, betrayed the Jili due to anger over getting demoted prior to the war, throwing the Jili troops into chaos that the Fengtians capitalized on to ultimately win the war. At some point in this conflict, Zhang was able to defeat the forces of Jili General General Wu Pei Fu by convincing Wu's men to defect to his side, promising the men that they will be able to keep their ranks should they change sides. After the battle, Zhang also promoted all of his officers in a big promotion ceremony, but ran into a problem when he realized he did not have enough gold and silver to make the rank insignia pins for his men. To solve this shortage problem, Zhang decided to create the insignias from the metal foil found in cigarette packages, cutting them into star shapes to give to his officers. These tin foil insignias began to rip and fall apart before the ceremony was over, but at least it's a thought that counts. Zhang kept his hot streak going by capturing Shanghai in 1925, then later Nanjing for the Fengtian clique. Zhang took special interest in Shanghai due to its position as a bustling port city. A bustling port city means a bustling smuggling and drug trade, mostly smuggling the bane of the Qing dynasty and Anthony Fantano, opium. Zhang was an avid opium enjoyer, because of course he would be, and he made connections with smugglers and gangsters to improve the drug trade and use the cash flow to fuel the Fengtian economy. Opium was such a cash cow for Zhang and the Fengtians that there was one event in which Zhang's officers got into a fight in his HQ over who would receive the most money from a recent opium deal, resulting in a standoff and shootout that left three of his officers dead. Zhang was eventually ousted from Shanghai and was subsequently appointed as governor of his home province of Shandong later in 1925. But that didn't stop him from making frequent trips to the city. He would often go to Shanghai with Zhang Zhulin's son, Zhang Zhuilang, to go drink, smoke opium, gamble, and smash hookahs, often blowing thousands and thousands of dollars on these trips. That's pretty fucking sick. Go party and blow bands upon bands with your boss's son. <laughs> Zhang would also travel to Beijing to yuck it up with wealthy socialites, impressing them with his outrageous stories and lifestyle, blowing tens of thousands gambling and behaving like a quote, swashbuckler. Essentially a living storybook character to the upper class of Chinese society, much to their delight. Despite his positive reputation and charisma amongst his friends and other acquaintances, by this time Zhang had a ferocious reputation as one of China's most monstrous warlords, and he and his soldiers were known for their unique brutality, being big enjoyers of splitting melons, which was the act of splitting skulls apart with gun butts or swords and then oftentimes hanging the destroyed heads from telephone poles in gruesome displays. However, Zhang's tenure as governor of Shandong is where his legend and stories of his wacky behavior really start to solidify. Zhang continued his brutality during his tenure, violently suppressing all dissent to his rule. Two phrases became common across Shandong cities, cut apart to catch light and listen to the telephone. The former referring to the melon splitting I just mentioned, and the latter referring to Zhang's other favorite killing method, hanging dissidents from telephone poles to make them listen to the telephone. If any newspapers published any material criticizing him at all, Zhang would have the editor of the paper shot to death. Zhang ran Shandong, for lack of a better term, like complete shit, acting less like an actual governor and more like a tyrannical mobster, running the province and its economy into the ground almost single-handedly. From his headquarters in Jinan, he imposed heavy taxes on the people of Shandong, placing special taxes on them, taxing almost anything he could, even down to the smallest frivolities, such as lighters for opium pipes. Or he would just straight up extort and plunder the populace for cash. If he needed loans to pay his troops' salaries or purchase more weapons, he would simply shake down local banks and financial unions for cash, oftentimes forcing them into bankruptcy. Zhang also fell into the, just print more money bro, trick that many struggling economies do, and printed off so much provincial currency that it became essentially worthless. His economic mismanagement was so destructive and widespread that the entire educational system of Shandong had completely collapsed by 1927. He was sucking his province and people dry to fund his insane lifestyle and gave zero fucks about it. 
Zhang would spend all the money he collected on random bullshit and frivolities such as lavish gifts for his concubines, friends, and commanders, usually buying their loyalty this way. He operated his Jinan HQ like a medieval court slash frat house, hosting lavish parties and feasts with artists, writers, drug kingpins, arms dealers, diplomats, and journalists, acting as beneficiaries to them and funding their projects and lifestyles. He would blow tens of thousands of dollars gambling, getting his famous dog meat general title for his affinity for the domino poker game Pai Gao, which translated to English means eating dog meat. He did not get the title from his enjoyment of consuming dog meat as you might initially think although he allegedly ate dog meat from black chow chow dogs every day, as he believed it boosted his sexual prowess and virility, which wasn't an uncommon belief for the time. Zhang was also in contention for title of the greatest sex haver in history. Zhang was very fond of his dick and would often boast about its size, receiving the titles of Old 86 and the general with three long legs due to its legendary reputation. Old 86 being a possible reference to his dick being as long as 86 Mexican silver dollars stacked up, which measures out to about nine and a half inches. Our guy Chang had a fucking kid. The general with three long legs being obvious, although you may note that it says long legs. That is because of Zhang's height, which was abnormally tall for the average Chinese person. Zhang stood at around six foot six and was also physically strong, making for an imposing figure. Some even claim he may have been up to seven feet tall. Height aside, back to sex habit. Zhang was a quote, well-known womanizer and polygamist and had a harem of anywhere from 30 to 50 women with the women being from up to 26 different nationalities. Unable to remember, nor did he care to remember, all of their names or speak most of their languages, Zhang solved this problem by just giving each of his concubines a number and would only refer to them by their number. One story claims that Zhang had found out that one of his concubines had fallen in love with one of his men. Rather than having the man killed, Zhang let them get married, saying that he didn't want to stand in the way of true love, suggesting he was not overly cruel to his concubines. Zhang's harem was one of his three don't knows, another title he gained for never knowing how much money he had, how many soldiers he had, or how many concubines he had. He didn't really sweat the details. Zhang was also, despite not being fully literate, a well-known poet. I'll read you one of his finest works now. Poem About Bastards by Zhang Zongchang You tell me to do this. He tells me to do that. You're all bastards. Go fuck your mother. Or how about another chain classic? This one has no title though. Someone asked me how many women I have. I really don't know either. Yesterday, a boy called me dad. I do not know who the mother is. This poetry is not without controversy, however, as it's disputed whether or not Zhang actually wrote any poetry at all, as he never officially published any of his poems. It may be the case that the poetry was made up and written by rival warlord Han Fu Ju as a slander job to make Zhang appear stupid and uncultured. Zhang never obtained any form of formal education, and when asked about where he got his education, he would say that he went to the College of the Green Forest, which meant that he was a woods bandit as a youth. The poems seem almost too ridiculous to be real, but at the same time, it tracks perfectly with what we know about Zhang's character. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether these poems are real or fake. This is just a symptom of the larger issue of trying to pin down truth from slander when it comes to information and antidotes about Zhang's life. Many aspects of Zhang's life are disputed, as his infamy and larger-than-life existence led to lots of embellished stories from both supporters and detractors alike that are hard to tell fact from fiction on. He was simultaneously loved by his commanders and underlings, while being viciously despised by rivals and those he subjugated across Shandong. Many stories about Zhang may simply be made up, but I like to think there's a decent amount of truth to most of them. These were unusual times in China, and shit can get pretty weird when the governor was dubbed by Time Magazine as China's basis general, not based, base, as in low and inhuman, and also as a former bandit chief. Shit can get pretty hairy to say the least. One such story is Zhang's coffin promise. At the time, Zhang usually traveled with a car that had a coffin strapped to the roof of it while out on campaign. This wasn't an uncommon thing to do, as it was a symbol used by wars to show that they were willing to die in combat. Zhang liked to ride in the coffin occasionally and would chain smoke Cuban cigars while chilling in the death basket. Zhang had previously publicly announced that if he were ever defeated in a battle, he would return home in a coffin. So when he was forced back by his opposition on one of his campaigns, he did indeed return home in a coffin, just smoking one of his Cuban cigars, waving to the crowd as he paraded through the streets, making good on his promise. Well, technically, he did return in a coffin. The next story, which is my personal favorite of Zhang's, can be introduced with another of Zhang's poems, titled Praying for Rain. The Sky God is also named Zhang. Why does he make life hard for me? If it doesn't rain in three days, I'll demolish your temple. Then I'll have cannons bombard your mom. Cannons referring to penises. 
Zhang is threatening to fuck the Dragon King's mom. It's the summer of 1927, and Shandong is in the grip of famine, brought on by Zhang's own wastefulness and plundering of his province, as well as a drought. In hopes of ending the drought, Zhang went to the Temple of the Dragon King, the Chinese god of water and storms, to pray for rain. However, it seemed like the Dragon King wasn't in the mood to hear that bullshit, and no rain came. So Zhang returned to the temple, approached the statue of the Dragon King, and began slapping and shouting at it, reportedly saying, Fuck your sister, how dare you make Shandong's people suffer by not giving us rain. He then ordered his men to aim artillery at the sky and fire at it to force the dragon god to bring rain. <laughs> After several hours of shelling the sky, according to reports, it rained the next day. Zhang had just went to war with the god of weather and won, allegedly obtaining the title of 72 Cannon Chang for these events. Either that, or that title is just another reference to his large cock. Some other Zhang tales include when he attended a basketball game for the first time, he was confused as to why there was only one ball being used, remarking that he was embarrassed that they only had one ball, saying, Why the hell are we fighting over a single ball? We're the hosts. Are we seriously this poor? He then gave every player a ball, leaving almost everyone in attendance confused. Zhang was also very close with his mother, and she accompanied him almost everywhere he went. Zhang even having a special train car built just for her so she could follow him on campaigns, as well as her being present at military strategy meetings, often holding her opinion in higher regard than his commanders. I wonder if her exorcist and witch backgrounds had her performing incantations to help Zhang's army. Zhang had also planned to build a shrine dedicated to his favorite thing, himself, that would feature a bronze statue of him in its full glory that he would be able to collect donations from. Fortunately though, before he was able to build the shrine, in 1928 the National Revolutionary Army had reached Shandong. In 1926, the Kuomintang Nationalists began the Northern Expedition, which was a campaign spearheaded by KMT Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek to reunify the fragmented and cliqued up nation and to put an end to the warlords for good. Zhang remained loyal to the Feng Tian clique, making for and briefly taking Shanghai before being forced north by the NRA. With Zhang's situation getting more and more desperate, he came up with an interesting plan. He wanted to build several warplanes to bolster his air force, hoping that air superiority would be able to drive back the mostly groundlocked NRA forces. He commissioned a German technician named Franz Oster to design and build some planes for him. Oster was able to build and ship a plane to Zhang, but when Zhang tried to fly it, the plane was so shoddily constructed that it could not even get off the ground, let alone fly. In 1928, Zhang was defeated by the NRA general Bai Chonghui, with Bai defeating Zhang's army and capturing 20,000 of his 50,000-ish men. But this was not before Zhang was able to make his escape, hopping the Great Wall and escaping with a sizable sum of loot from Shandong, along with all of his concubines. Can't forget those. Leaving Shandong to burn in the chaos, a fitting parting gift from Zhang, the one last shit taken on his former province. With Shandong lost and Feng Tian leader Zhang Zulin assassinated in a train car explosion, known as the Zhang Zulin Explosion Death Incident, no joke. That's like if you called the JFK assassination the JFK headshot death incident. He was assassinated by Japanese forces trying to clear him out of the way for their upcoming invasion of Manchuria. Despite these heavy losses, Zhang still didn't give up the fight against the NRA and KMT, attempting an overthrow of Zhulin's son and former smoking buddy Zhang Shui Lang, after Shui Lang had made his intentions to make peace with the Kuomintang public. This overthrow, however, failed, with Zhang's forces getting completely cooked by the joint Zhu Lang NRA forces, even being betrayed by his Russian mercenaries that had given him so much success in the past. With his army lost and territories in KMT hands, Zhang fled to Japanese-held Dalian for protection, loot and concubines in tow, can't forget those. This didn't stop him from getting into wacky adventures though, because in 1929 he made a pact of brotherhood with a ronin named Date Junosuke, impressing on Date so much that he changed his name to Zhang Zongyan and changed his nationality to Chinese, another example of Zhang's almost superhuman riz. Fun fact, Zhang Yuan would later go on to take over the city of Zhang's old HQ, Jinan, in Shandong in 1937, and would later go on to be tried and executed for war crimes revolving around a massacre of 400 people during the Second Sino-Japanese War during World War II. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Despite being armyless and in exile, Zhang stayed scheming, brainstorming several plots to regain his losses, and in 1929, returned to Shandong with some close allies to launch an uprising against the current Shandong administrator Liu Zhenian, a former underling of Zhang's who had switched to the Kuomintang after Zhang's defeat. Zhang rallied thousands of former demobilized soldiers and fought for several brutal months, further shitting on and destroying poor Shandong, before ultimately being defeated and fleeing back to Dalian. However, Japanese authorities barred Zhang from re-entering Dalian, so Zhang instead went to Mojiku and later the city of Beppu on the Japanese mainland, where he lived with his mother, any Lu he still had, and his concubines. Can't forget those. 
Zhang's life on Beppu was fairly quiet, minus one incident. A cousin of the last Qing Emperor Pu Yi, Prince Yang Kai, was ah! shot dead in the street. The culprit? Old 86. Zhang's story was that he was standing near his open hotel window, cleaning his gun, minding his own business, when the gun happened to unexpectedly go off, just as Zhang Kai happened to be passing by, with the wild shot tragically and perfectly striking Zhang Kai in the back, killing him instantly. The real reason for this murder was likely that Zhang Kai was getting a little too frisky with one of Zhang's concubines, and it killed him in revenge. In any case, Zhang was tried and convicted by a Japanese court, and they offered him the choice of either 15 days in prison or a $150 fine as punishment. Pay the court a fine or serve your sentence. Zhang paid the fine. As to why his sentence was so low for murdering someone, I cannot say. It's now 1932, and Japan has begun their invasion of Manchuria. In response to this, Zhang declared his intent to return to China and help in the fight against the Japanese invaders. He traveled to Jinan to visit with some former friends, and on September 3rd, 1932, walked the city's train station to travel to Beijing. Zhang was approached and shot by the nephew of a former officer of who Zhang had split the melon of. According to sources, Zhang's last words were, No good! And with that, the Dogmeat General's time on Earth had concluded. His assassin was fully pardoned by the Kuomintang government, leading some to believe that the assassination was a plot done by the local government to remove Zhang from the Chinese political picture for good. But even in death, Zhang still managed to cause wacky events. His funeral was a public spectacle. His funeral procession spanned for two miles, attracting former colleagues and family, paid mourners, and quote, the curious. Sometime after the funeral, a local shop clerk claimed to have found a check good for $30 million from the Nanjing government on Zhang's body. The Nanjing finance minister then gave the man a first-class train ticket to go return the check in person. However, after arriving, the man said that he had misread the check's value, with the check only being worth $300,000. The government caught a lot of flack from local news sources for getting fleeced by some random shopkeep, who was able to make some money by swapping his first-class ticket for a third-class ticket and just pocketing the difference, which is just poetry for Zhang's life. Zhang's rest was not very peaceful. Legends of Zhang's wealth and exploits caused his grave to be repeatedly robbed over time, and was even dug up by Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. But by that time, all that was left of his grave was a single stone tablet. Not even Skele Zhang remained. Zhang is remembered across China as a wicked and violent man, and I can't think of anyone who more embodies his era than Zhang. Of all the chaos and violence of the Warlord era, he was the most chaotic and violent of them all. He is the most interesting man of the 20th century, and the basest in both ways. Warlord of all time. And with that, I'll leave you on one last poem, titled, Visiting Pengai Pavilion. What a pavilion. Place is fucking nice. If the gods can get here, I'll take a seat too. Have a drink by the window. Sing some songs to the ocean. Play some cards. I think I'll get drunk.